Well, today we are very excited to welcome Keith Burns from Green Cover Seed. Um, I'm sure most people are familiar with Green Cover Seed, but we're excited to have Keith on here. He's given some excellent presentations before on carbonomics, and but today we wanted to just have a discussion and and get to know Keith. Um, Green Cover Seed has been an excellent partner and sponsor um, to a lot of our events and. Um, as you know, they're they're a leader in the cover crop community, and, and just wanted to get going. So thanks, Keith, for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's uh, my pleasure, Liz. Um, first, I just wanted to start out with an introduction so people can get to know you. Um, you know, wanted to say or find out, you know, where were you raised? Um, I know you have a farm. Um, yeah. How did you get started? How long have you been farming? Yeah, no, happy to, to share that information. It's a, kind of a fun story. So, you know, I'm actually living in the same house that I grew up in. Uh, so my family was raised here on the farm. So we're in south central Nebraska, so about 30 miles south of Hastings, or for those not so familiar with Nebraska, we're, we're about two and a half hours southwest of Lincoln. So south central part of Nebraska. We are born I was actually born in Moline, Illinois. My dad was an engineer for John Deere, but he moved back to his family farm area here when I was one year old. So I don't really claim Illinois as my as my home state. I definitely a Nebraskan. Um, uh, after graduating, uh, I, I went to the University of Nebraska, got my degree in ag education, and I taught school for 10 years. So I was an ag teacher for four years and then kind of morphed my way over into computers and technology. This would have been the late 80s and early 90s. And so personal computers were just coming in. So I spent some time kind of uh, doing tech coordinator stuff at a couple different schools. And um, my wife and I moved back to the farm in 1998 and started farming full time with my brother, Brian, because uh, dad was retiring. So it kind of opened up an opportunity for us to move back. And he had been experimenting with no-till since, you know, the, the early 80s, the the late 80s and when I moved back we made the determination to go 100% no-till on everything and really we're very committed to that cause and to that uh, transition and we were very involved with uh, the no-till groups and organizations particularly no-till on the plains and so you know my brother was on the board I did the website for the for no-till on the plains and and it was such a good move for us because not only did we learn a lot of things but we met so many people people and and as in anything it's so so much of your opportunities come from the people that you know and so we knew Gabe Brown and we knew all these you know people who are you know were kind of pioneers of regenerative ag movement we knew them back before we ever started green cover because they were also involved in these no-till uh the no-till movement the no-till organizations and so uh, kind of a, a pivotal moment for us was in 2000 and uh, I believe 2006, a man by the name of Adamir Caligari from Brazil came to the No-Till on the Plains Conference. And Adamir uh, was kind of the, the, the cover crop guru of South America. And he came over and was showing us all these pictures and telling us all these stories of what pe farmers in Brazil were doing with these, this, this crazy concept called cover crop mixes, these cocktail mixes blends, whatever you want to call them, but you know, six, seven, eight, 10 different things all mixed together. And then they plant them out there and, and we're seeing amazing results and pretty new concept to everybody. Cause anybody that was doing a cover crop in 2006, uh, it was, you know, well, yeah, we planted some sorghum, we planted some millet or we have radishes. Radishes were kind of a hot thing out there. And so that was kind of a revolutionary concept we thought it was cool, but we didn't do anything with it. But Gabe Brown and Jay Fuhrer and that whole very innovative group of people up there in the Bismarck, North Dakota area, they took it and they put it out in the plots. And so they, they were extraordinarily dry in 2006 in North Dakota, but they put these plots out with monoculture strips and, and they all burn up to a crisp. Nothing really grew and survived, but where they mixed all these seeds together, just like the pictures that Adamir was showing, they had incredible results. And, and that inspired us to kind of do the same thing here in Nebraska. So in 2008, 
we wrote a little Sarah grant. We got like $5,000 to buy some moisture sensors. And we put these sensors in the ground and we planted monoculture strips of all these different cover crops. And then we planted mixes. And then these moisture sensors monitored the water that, that, that was raining because this is all dry land. So it monitored soil moisture. And, and what we saw very, very clearly was the same thing that Gabe and Jay saw up there, but we saw it on the moisture sensors is that anything grown in a monoculture used far more water than anything grown in a mix. To this day, we can't necessarily explain all the mechanisms of that, but it's, it's, it was you know, data that was showing the same thing that Gabe and Jay saw that these mixes were just so much more efficient at using moisture. And so as a result of that, uh, you know, we learned three things. Number one, we learned that, that the mixes were much more water efficient. Number two, we learned that the cattle livestock did fantastic on these mixes because we planted the rest of this field to, to a cover crop mix. And then number three, we discovered it was really hard to find these things. If you're looking for 30 different types of cover crop seed, it just wasn't readily available. It was hard. To source. And so as a result of all those, we decided, decided to start Green Cover Seed in 2009 and, and try to offer these diverse blends to people. And so from the very beginning, because of the experience that we had, we have been huge proponents of cover crop mixes and the power of diversity from the very beginning. And because we didn't start out as a seed company, you know, we don't, we don't sell corn and soybeans and wheat seed we didn't before and we don't now because we started as a cover crop only seed company it has allowed us to really focus and to really zero in on cover crops cover crop mixes how these different species interact with each other you know when to plant them how to plant them and, and all these things all of our energy has been devoted to cover crops only and not the other hybrid type things for cash crops which are still important it's just not what we do uh, we've been able to really focus in on that and develop some innovative things around that space. But, you know, Jeff, to Liz, just to give you a, a, an example of how fast it's grown, you know, in 2009, we, we moved enough seed out to people to cover about a thousand acres and, and probably half of that was ours. And then we, you know, just sold to other people that we knew through the no-till group that wanted some. And, and it's grown every year since then. And we, you know, had to hire a lot of people and build a lot of buildings. But last year, uh, we moved enough seed out the door to seed about a million acres. And this year, we're, we're going to be running, you know, around 20% above that even. So well over a million acres going out the door this year. Uh, and and that's, that's, that's not just us that has grown that fast. That's, that's a testament to the whole industry whether you want to call it soil health, cover crops, regenerative ag, uh, it's, it's an indication of how, how fast that's caught on and how people are adopting it and continuing to do it because it works agronomically. So that's, that's kind of a long background in how we got started, but uh, it, it's interesting how all those connections work because so many of the people that we continue to utilize as resources and we partner with Many of them we met before we ever started the seed business simply because of our passion with no-till uh, farming at the time. I have found within, like you said, whatever you want to call it, um, cover crops, soil health, regenerative ag, that the community just seems to grow and grow and mm -hmm. grow. And we all, what I like is all help and support each other. but. Um, so what do you think as this industry is, is growing, and I, don't, I hate to call it industry, but as this movement or yeah. um, is growing, what do you attribute that to? What do you think are the major factors that, that say farmers or ranchers are seeing um, on their properties that are inspiring them to either start buying cover crops or buy more or expand? Sure. But, you know, there's a number of factors. Number one, you know, there's, there's just a group of people out there that are just crazy enough to try just about anything and everything. And, you know, those, we love working with those innovators because, you know, and, and, and like, you know, it's like Gabe and Jay, you know, that'd be great examples because there were a thousand people in that room that hear, heard Adamir talk about these concepts. 
to my knowledge, they were the only ones that took it home and did something with it right away. And so we love working with people like that, that just, you know, they, they see a concept and they think, huh, I wonder if I could do that on my farm. And, and there's a lot of people out there like that. And that's, that's the great part about this regenerative ag community. These people are fearless, but they're also 100% not afraid to tell you that they failed and 100% not afraid to tell you what worked for them as well. And, and so that you can learn from their mistakes you can, you can build upon their successes. And it's just such a great community of people who are willing to share. It's, it's really an open source information. And that's the way we want to be as a company as well. You know, we're pretty passionate about, you know, publishing a lot of educational materials like this is our eighth edition, Soil Health Resource Guide. We're working on our ninth <coughs> edition and, and we print, you know, 25 to 30,000 of these every year. And we, we give them away completely for free you know, all of our, you know, information on our website's all free. So <clears throat> we have gotten so much from the community around us that we want to be able to contribute and participate back. So, so that would be the first thing is that there's just a real core group of innovators who are pushing this thing forward. Number two, I think that, you know, initially a lot of traction uh, got, got it, you know, to the ground because, it was so easy to see how cover crops could reduce erosion. And in certain areas, the you know, erosion is just a huge problem. And it still is. But within, the, again, within that people that had the mindset of, I really want to protect my land for future generations, cover crops just made a huge amount of sense. And so that went in, I think, early on within the movement. And then as more and more weeds became resistant to some of the chemistries that are out there, more and more people started to jump on board from a weed control standpoint, because, you know, particularly cereal rye can just, it just has a lot of positive benefits uh, for weed suppression. So we started seeing a number of people come on board with doing these things from a weed suppression standpoint. And then of course, you know, there's, there's different government programs and, you know, equip contracts and CSP contracts that, you know, people would be in. And, and you can kind of tell if they're in it just for the program or if the program is helping them really accomplish the long-term goals that they want to have there. And then really underlying all of that, Liz, would be, you know, they're a big portion of our customer base are, are guys with livestock. And it's just so easy for them to justify these practices because not only do they see the great improvement that they're seeing in their soil health, water infiltration, water holding capacity, less erosion, all those things, they can directly monetize the planting of these cover crops when they graze them. Mm -hmm. And there's just tremendous benefit and value to the grazing of this. And, and there's just all kinds of documented cases of, you know, how much you can add to a farmer's bottom line when they have their own livestock. And I want to stress this, when they graze it properly, because if you improperly graze it, graze it too much, graze it too long, you can actually send your soil health backwards into a negative state. But when it's done properly and when it's done right, and again, you know, Gabe and Jay and those guys up in North Dakota did a lot of, you know, really groundbreaking uh, research and collected data on this. It can increase the carbon content. It can increase your organic matter faster than just about any other way of doing it. So I think those things have all led to, you know, the continued growth of this. And, you know, now, you know, there's this huge infusion or will soon be this huge influx of money into the in, into the movement, again, if you will, you know, with the climate smart commodities grants that are being released. And, I, you know, I thought it was a billion dollars, but now they're saying they're going to be awarding two point eight billion dollars worth of grants in this in this round. And so I don't know what that's all going to look like. I haven't really read through them. We're not directly involved in any of them, but there's going to be a a lot of opportunities for a lot of people to participate and and potentially have some incentives to help them get this started. Yeah, um, I think that announcement was huge, and I did see that they were adding more funding to it. So we, I, I'm not sure how that's going to look or what awards are going to come out for that. But um, you you had mentioned like government programs and CFP and climate smart commodities. Um, there's also lots of other programs out there like carbon programs. Um, how do you feel like all of these are going to affect 
um, regenerative ag as a whole or the adoption of maybe no-till cover crops and different practices like that? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly going to have a positive benefit towards the adoption. Now, how much of that is, will be long-term adoption? You know, the, so the big question is, will producers continue to do these practices even at the expiration of whatever program that they're in because they see them work agronomically? And, and the answer to that is going to be, it depends. It depends on how they implement these, uh, you know, Steve Groff, a good friend of mine, and has been a, a cover crop pioneer for many years. I love this saying that he has. He says, cover crops will make a good farmer better and a bad farmer worse. And, and I love that because it, it's emphasizing the fact that cover crops will work if you are willing to apply the additional management that it requires to integrate it into your system. Now, if you're not willing to change anything else in your system, and you're just trying to force cover crops into the this hole that you've got and you don't change anything else within your system, it's probably not going to work and you're probably not going to see the benefits and that the expiration of your pro program that you're in, you're probably not going to continue to do it. But if you're willing to manage the system and, and, and manage it as a system, whether it be tweaking your rotation a little bit or tweaking some timings to where cover crops are now part of the bigger picture and not just an extra piece thrown in there, it, it's going to work quite well, uh, particularly again for the livestock guys, but but for the for the non-livestock guys as well. And particularly for the people that own their own land or have long-term control over the land. The, the people that are going to struggle with trying to justify it are going to be the ones that have no long-term control over the ground that they farm because so many of the benefits that accrue from these practices you get some immediate benefit, but but they're compounding and cascading benefits, which means they get better and better and better every year. And the longer you do it, the better it gets. And so if you're putting all this money into something for the first two, three years, and then you lose that land, somebody else is benefiting from all the work and investment that you did. So I think that there's, there's huge opportunity for us as a movement uh, I like that word, by the way, much better than industry, us as a movement to really reach out to the landowners and landlords and get them to see the benefits of these practices and encourage them to talk to their tenants about, you know, long-term leases or long-term arrangements to where if you make these investments, you know, we're, we're going to promise that you'll have, you know, control over this ground for, you know, five years, 10 years, whatever that number is that, that, they can both agree to and be comfortable with, you'll see a much higher adoption rate from those producers if they know that they're gonna be in line to reap the benefits down the road of that. Yeah, and speaking to that, um, maybe not only the landowners, but also like generationally, have you seen um, the transition from say a dad to a son or a granddad on down, has has that been something you've encountered that might be some, somewhat difficult or, um, cause I, I see that a lot. Some of the younger generations yeah. want to come up and do something different, but it's hard. To, I mean, we all know it's hard to change anything we do. So. Yeah, that's, yeah, we, we see that too. And you know, there's, there's some young guys that come to us and, you know, they ask a lot of questions. They want to do this, that, or the other thing. And, and then they say, well, but you know, I got to, I got to ask dad or I got to ask grandpa and, and totally understand that. But what some of them have done, and I think this is very clever and, and very creative, and I would encourage anyone listening in a similar situation, they've, they've talked them into saying, hey, give me, and it doesn't matter if it's 10 acres, 20 acres, 40 acres, give me this field that I can kind of try some of these things on and experiment with and, and just, you know, let me do this kind of proof of concept type thing, if you will. And, and then they can kind of have total control over that smaller piece of ground. And, and I totally would encourage people to do that. I don't want anybody to go out and try some new practice that they're, they or the rest of their family are not comfortable with on a large scale. You can learn as much on 20 acres as you can on a thousand acres. Uh, you, you, but again, you have to manage that intensively. You have to really pay attention. You have to be really good observers. I, I think that that's one of the things that 
farmers of, of, you know, my generation and the upcoming generations, by and large, we've lost the power and the ability to observe. We, we, we've come to rely on technology too much and, and we don't spend enough time in the field just physically observing and not just observing that this chemical work or these bugs coming in, but observing, you know, hey, what's going on over in this road ditch or what's going on over here in this, you know, a CRP field that hasn't been farmed, but it's got all this diversity or what's going on, you know, with my neighbor's field that's doing this crazy cover cropping thing. You know, for, for the most part, you know, we're not nearly as good as observers as our forefathers would have been generations ago because they didn't have the benefit of technology. They had to use their own senses to figure out, to, to observe and then figure out what was going on. And I think if we can get back to having more of that skill, particularly if we can focus it on a small area, then we can prove that, you know what, this concept does work. And then the father, you know, can maybe say, you know what, I, that did better than I thought. Let's, let's roll that out on, you know, a couple of quarters or let's roll that out on the, you know, the home pivot and kind of scale up and build up from there. But, but Liz, one of the coolest things that we see, whether it's at a show or when people come, I absolutely love it when older farmers and, you know, in their 60s or even 70s, and they've got really no great reason to try to learn something new and completely change their system. But yet there's some of them out there that do, and, and they're the most passionate about it. And, and they're so excited about being able to change their system for the better, even though they know that they're close to retirement age, because again, they know that they've got other people within their family line that will benefit from the changes that they're employing to make their land better. And that's really exciting when you see that happen. Yeah, I, I, I get really excited when that happens as well, especially at a larger event. And it's not the maybe 25 year old farmer that's gonna be taken over soon. It's, well, I've been doing this for 50 years and now I gotta change. Yeah. <laughs> so. That, yeah, that's always exciting. Yeah, you know, and there, the other thing is there's, let's be honest, there's a lot of farmers out there that that maybe don't have children that want to come back and be part of the operation. And so, you know, the transitional plan is a little bit in flux and unknown. And I know some guys doing some creative things there too, you know, inviting young couples into the operation and working on a transitional plan to not only teach them how to do the farming techniques and practices, but then also putting in place a way to transition not only some of the decision making, but eventually some of the ownership uh, over to them and doing that. And, and again, my hat's off and I, I wholeheartedly applaud, you know, individuals who are willing to do that to give young people a chance because we all know, you know, it's so expensive to start a farming operation that if you don't have that initial capital or that initial family connection to get started, uh, it's really hard to break into it if you're going to do larger scale production. Now, there's a lot of opportunities, you know, to, to do some specialty things, you know, grass fed beef, pastured pork, you know, vegetables, things like that direct to the consumer marketing that, that you can start at with a pretty low capital investment. But if you want to get into the larger scale production, that's really, really hard to do without having some family connections of some sort. So we've had we've had people reach out to us and say, you know what, I'm getting ready to retire, but I want somebody to farm my land and this is the way I want it done. Do you have anybody in my area that would be interested? And, and we can help connect them. And there's there's other there's other. Uh, websites and software starting up that are going to help. It's almost like a dating service for landlords and tenants uh, to want to come together, um, you know, re people with regenerative mindsets to bring them together to, to make that transition easier. Yeah, I, I think it's great as the community is, is built out. And I do hope that these um, grants help further that as well. Um, you mentioned we have some questions in the in the chat, but first, um, you've mentioned a couple of times experimenting. Y'all started out experimenting on your own land. Um, you know, I know I encourage, and I've heard you and other people encourage people just to try out different things mm -hmm. um, on their own land. Can you describe how that might look 
to someone that maybe hasn't used cover crops before, or maybe has just used like cereal rye, um, you know, what, what that would look like to them operationally. Sure. Yeah. You know, so if, if you're just, if you're just starting out, you know, the first thing I would do is I would look to what are, what are my local resources? Cause you can, you can get on YouTube and watch, you know, Gabe Brown videos all day long and, and Gabe's doing some great things. But if you try to take what Gabe is doing and, and, and do those same things on your farm, I can almost promise you that you will fail because what works for Gabe in Bismarck, North Dakota is not going to work for other people. Now the, the principles will work, but you're going to have to tweak the practices to fit your own environment. And that's why, you know, when, when we talk about the soil health principles, you know, the, the five soil health principles that you know USDA has been preaching for, for many years, you know, the understanding ag guys, Gabe Brown and Ray Archuleta, they kind of, they, they put a sixth one in there that is becoming more commonplace. And that's the context. What's the context of your operation? Because your context is going to be different than Gabe's or mine or anybody else's. And so you have to take what they're doing and then make it fit your operation. That's the contextual part of it. And so the first thing I would do is I would look locally and try to find out who else is doing something similar. It may not be your direct neighbor, but more than likely within an hour's drive of you and in a similar type environment and climate, somebody's going to be doing something that you can learn about. And so I would seek those people out and I would pick their brain. And, and again, the people within this space, this community are very open to sharing. And so my guess is they, they are not going to mind sharing that information with you. And I would start there. I would start by going, okay, will that work on my operation? If you don't know anywhere else to start and you're a corn soybean guy, the absolute easiest thing to do is to plant cereal rye after you harvest your corn and plant your soybeans into that. And there's there's a whole number of agronomic reasons why that's the easiest, the, the, the highest chance of having a, a, a really positive experience. And we can get into that later if we have time. But I start simple. You don't have to start with a 12-way mix across the entire farm. Start simple. And, and the way we learned all, you know, almost everything we've learned about cover crops is by, we planted literally thousands of, of test strips and test plots. Every year we'll plant, you know, 100 to 150 six foot wide strips of different things. And then we spend a lot of time out there observing, oh, that's the difference between a cow pea and a mung bean. And so again, dedicate a small area to doing some crazy things, doing a variety of different things. But even beyond that, if you're going to do a cover crop out in a field, the easiest thing in the world is to just skip a pass. Leave one pass where you don't plant the cover crop. And then for the next year, you can observe, is this pass where it had nothing, is it better or is it worse? Does it have more weeds or does it have less? Did I get more rainfall to infiltrate than, than, than or, or less? There's a ton of things you can observe just by the side by side with and without. And then again, with the equipment that most people have today it's pretty easy to you know okay I'm planting the majority of my field at 50 pounds of this cover crop seed if I'm going to do one strip at 30 pounds I'm going to do one strip at 70 pounds and then again I'm going to observe that is it better is it worse do I need 50 pounds is 70 pounds better or can I get by with 30 you don't know unless you do those types of things and that takes almost no time no effort to do it really didn't cost you anything because your your average is seed with one strip at 30 and one strip at 70, you're still averaging 50, but yet now you've got things that you can look at, observe, and learn from, and then implement into next year. And then share that. Share that information with the, the network of people that you've built, and you can all learn from each other by doing those things. So, so those, those are just some pretty simple ways to, to do it. And then, you know, don't be afraid to, to get on YouTube and spend time listening to what other people people have done. Don't be afraid to get in your car and drive to a field day, whether if you're close enough to come and, you know, see, you know, our plots where we have over a hundred different cover crops. Great. If, if you're not close enough to us, somebody in your area is going to be doing something that's worth driving to and, and observing and, and picking their brain about. Yeah. And if you, if you can't find someone 
that you know or have direct connection with, you know, within driving distance, I know you can reach out to us or Green Cover Seed or, you know, anybody in our network and we'll help find you someone you can talk to or we'll talk to you ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I know I've asked Green Cover Seed lots of questions and um, they've helped me a lot. Um, so we did actually, you mentioned corn soy and we did have a question um, in the chat. So after we harvest our corn crop in Michigan, how soon should we plant a cover crop? And they're going into soybeans next spring. Yeah, so I would, I mean, I would get it going as soon as you can. You know, if you can have the drill in the field chasing the combine, that's great. Uh, you know, some, some places they'll actually broadcast the seed before they harvest to try to get it up and going that, but you know, before harvest, that works well in wetter environments if you're irrigated. Uh, and, and, you know, people all the time, you know, say, well, you know, I didn't get my corn harvested till, you know, October 25th, and it's obviously too late to plant any cover crops. So I just parked all the equipment and, you know, went south for the winter or whatever. And, you know, we really try to stress to people, you know, cereal rye is an amazing plant and it's, it's literally never too late to plant cereal rye. Uh, it, it germinates at 34 degrees soil temperature and nothing else does that. You know, it, it may not get out of the ground and grow a ton, but it's going to, it's going to germinate. You're going to have a sprout there and that's enough to make that plant vernalize so that when the spring, you know, when it warms up in the spring, that thing's ready to take off. And, and cereal rye never goes completely brown in the wintertime like what wheat or, you know, the other cereals do. And because of that, if it's 38 degrees and the sun is shining, which for a lot of people, that describes a lot of winter days, it's 38 degrees or higher in the sun, you know, there's a little bit of sunshine. Cereal rye will actually be photosynthesizing. And, and again, you may not see a huge amount of growth. But if it's if that plant is green and it's getting that sunlight and it's photosynthesizing, it's putting carbon root exudates into the soil, it's feeding your biology, it's keeping your system alive. And so because it has it's, it's almost like a trickle charge on a battery, it's it's setting there primed and ready to go so that when it does warm up in the spring, it just it takes off like crazy. And that's why cereal rye can grow so incredibly fast in the springtime when the warmer weather does come because it's been growing a little bit all winter long. And so I would say, get it out there as soon as you can, even if it's, you know, the middle of November, I've got people all the time that tell me, oh yeah, we planted our cereal rye in December and it was fine. Again, you're not gonna see a ton of fall growth, but it will be there in the spring. So in, in you know, Tom, in your situation, I would get that going as soon as I could after I harvested, because even though it can be planted later, you still take a penalty in how much it grows and how fast it grows and the benefits that you get the later that you wait. So it's always better to go sooner rather than later when it comes to these fall planted cover crops, but later is still better than never. And I tell people all the time, I would rather plant rye in December than to plant oats in March uh, because most years it, from, from, a, from a growth standpoint, you're gonna be way ahead with December planted rye. Now that's assuming, you know, the ground isn't frozen solid like a rock and there's not a foot of snow on the ground. If that happens, <clears throat> well, then you, you have to wait and, you know, take advantage of the next chance that you have. But if you have the opportunity to, to get out there and scratch that in, uh, I would still do that. Late planted rye versus early planted oats is almost always going to be better. Yeah. Um... And, and so Tom also was mentioning that, that their farmer has been using Roundup, but they want to transition to organic. And I want to point out that the organic regenerative farmers that I know, especially in the Northern climates are all growing lots of cereal, cereal rye cover crops to manage weed control. Because if you don't have that cover out there and that residue cover, it, it's, it's going to be hard. If you're if you're not able to spray, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So making you know making that transition to organic from conventional, I, I mean it's really hard you know to to be to be no till organic. I mean I've always said that's the holy grail of soil health. If you can eliminate both tillage and chemicals, 
that's the holy grail of soil health. I mean, you've got to figure it out and you're, you're doing it. And there are people out there that are getting pretty darn close to, to making it happen and making it work. Liz, I know you've had you know, Rick Clark on and he's, you know, in my opinion, one of the people at the top of that list. But even Rick, you know, doing and knowing all the things that he does, you know, like this year, he still had to go out and, and do some tillage because he simply, the, the, the year did not give him the weather conditions to allow him to grow enough cover crop biomass to provide the weed control that he needed. And so don't get hung up on completely eliminating everything. Because if we're going to farm, even if it's regenerative organic, we need to have tools. Now, for some people, Roundup is a tool. For others, tillage is a tool. And so don't be afraid to, uh, to not use those tools that are in your toolbox. You just use them properly. Use them as little as possible. Because every time you use a tool, it's going to cost you money. And too many people are using tools way too often. And now all of a sudden they've got so many dollars tied up in the production of their crops because they didn't think about what was the right tool to use, what was the right timing to use it, and how often can it be used. So cover crops can certainly be a huge part of that transition uh, over to organic farming, uh, particularly from a weed control standpoint. You know, like Liz said, you know, the cereal grains allow you to, you know, grow a lot of biomass, you know, some of those cover crops can be crimped very well, you know, if you get the timing right there. So there's, again, we don't have time to go into all the intricacies of this, but certainly cover crops are going to be a huge part of any type of uh, regenerative organic operation. Yeah, and I got really excited that you pointed out that we still have tools to use. And I'm not a fan of being operationally restrictive for the sake of yeah. a name um, or a label. So um, I've asked farmers when I have them on these and, and also privately, like, do you find it more difficult to be a conventional farmer or a regenerative farmer? And I had one person tell me that as far as my butt getting tired in the tractor seat, that's harder if you're conventional, but my brain is going a lot more, they think, as a regenerative farmer. So it, it is utilizing every tool that you have in front of you, just using it in the smartest way possible. Yeah. Yep. Um, you touched on cereal grains, and, and there was a question that Jim had, um, can you use winter wheat as a cover crop? Um, and, and maybe what might be the difference there between that and a, and a cereal rye or a, yeah. a blend? Sure. So winter wheat is a cover crop. It, it's, that's certainly an option. Here's, here's why we don't encourage the use of winter wheat as a cover crop. Number one, we don't ever want you to use something as a cover crop if it's part of your cash crop rotation. So if you're growing corn and beans, Corn and beans should not be part of your cover crop because we're trying to break those cycles. We, we want to have as long a period of, of uh, a break period between those cash crops as possible. So if you're putting soybeans in your cover crop mix, then that's vectoring diseases and insects for that next soybean cash crop. So if you have wheat in your rotation or you think you might have wheat in your rotation, I would not use wheat as a cover crop. Now, beyond that, uh, the other reason that, you know, we wouldn't necessarily use that would be just agronomic principles. Cereal rye is going to have approximately twice as much root mass as what winter wheat does. It's just, you know, most of these wheat varieties have been bred over the years. Uh, first of all, they're semi dwarfed so they're only going to get about 30 inches tall, where cereal rye will, will almost always be double that. So we've got twice as much above ground biomass. And that's generally reflected below the ground as well. And you'll have twice as, as much root mass with the cereal rye crop as what you will with winter wheat. The other thing is, you know, wheat seed tends to be larger berries. And so you'll have, have you know, 12 to 15,000 seeds per pound, whereas cereal rye, smaller, you're going to have 18 to 22,000 seeds per pound. So even if cereal rye costs 30% more, you can probably seed 30% less and still have the same number of plants out there. So that, that kind of evens up the economics of that a little bit. So when you pull all those things together, you know, we really like rye as the cover crop of choice. And one last thing that I would mention about winter wheat, 
with, you know, again, with all of the breeding that's been done with it, it's typically all that research is done in relatively high input environments because they're breeding for one thing and that's, that's yield, grain yield. And when they do that, you, you deselect for other things. And, and that's one of the reasons you don't see wheat with as good a root system. Uh, there's some emerging research and data out there showing that some of these new varieties of wheat don't have the mycorrhiza associations that, that the old wheats would. We actually have some wheat that we're using as a cover crop, but we're using Scout 66 and Turkey Red. You know, some of these things would have been popular back in the 40s and 50s and 60s because we feel that the genetics of those are more pure to what we would want as a cover crop. They're not going to be great grain yielders, but that's not our goal. So we're going back and looking at these old school varieties to employ as cover crops because Turkey Red and Scout 66, they don't get 30 inches tall. They want to get five feet tall, six feet tall, just like this rye does. And so then I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm getting a lot, a lot of the benefits from the rye uh, because of that growth and that height. So that, that's kind of my take on winter wheat. But with all that being said, if you've got wheat and that's the only thing that you can plant, plant it. It's still better than nothing. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and when you're talking about the biomass, especially like and with what you're planting, I think it's it's common, you know, we need to think about the way you're going to terminate that cover crop as well. So I know we in down here tried to grow summer covers. It's hot and dry, 105 degrees out. That stuff does not get tall enough, no matter what we planted, to crimp it. So that's that's something to think about, you know, your termination method as well. And, and um, I know we didn't asked for what kind of blends um, of cover crop to plant. Um, Green Cover does have a cover crop seed calculator on their website, which is, is very beneficial. Um, and and like, like Keith was saying as well, and Keith, you can probably speak to this way better than I can, or I know you can, um, you know, thinking about the seeds per square foot that you're applying versus just a straight up seeding rate is very important too don't you think yeah you know so first of all you know our smart mix calculator is is a two, it's an online tool it's free anybody can use it you don't have to buy our seed in order to set yourself up an account and use that thing in fact i would say you know the you know more than half the people that use it aren't necessarily customers but but and we're okay with that i, I don't have enough seed for everybody anyway so that's okay but if we have something that we can help other people with, if there's knowledge, again, that's why we put money into this, the calculator and all those resources, because we really do want to see the whole movement increase and expand. And we know that we'll get our share of, of business from it and we'll be okay. And that's why we can give this away for free. But the calculator can help you put some of these mixes together, particularly some of the more complex mixes where you want to get a lot of diversity in. And, and in order to do that, you're really going to have to be planting those earlier. You know, it's not hard to make a cover crop mix for October because there's like four things that you can choose from that really make sense. But if you're planting that in August, there, there might be 40 things that, that could all be really good in there. So that's where you need a little bit more help and advice and guidance uh, along the way and down that path. So I would encourage you to check that out. You can just go to our website, greencover.com and, and click on the smart mix button. And uh, it can kind of help you put those things together. Um, and then Liz, I don't remember the second part of the question. Now. I got too excited about smart mix, I guess. Oh, um, well, like a specific example would be like the seed size oh, yeah, the of seed, say rape seed, rape right, seed yeah. versus cereal rye. Yeah. yeah. So when, when we were building that calculator, we struggled over this for a long time because some people, they, they say, well, how many pounds per acre should I plant? Or how many seeds per acre should I plant? And, and that, that varies widely because, you know, like Liz, like you were mentioning, you know, so, you know, turnips, you know, 150 to 170,000 seeds per pound, soybeans, you know, 3,000 seeds per pound. So do I go, I, I can't just go, I can't just say, well, you need 50 pounds because that might be right for soybeans but it would be a disaster with with the rapeseed and I can't say well you need a million seeds per acre because that might be okay for, for 
a cereal, but it would be terrible for soybeans. So the, the way that we do things and the way what's built into the calculator is we go off what's called a percentage of a full rate. And, and we look at each of those species and we say, okay, soybeans, a full rate of soybeans for a cover crop is going to be 50 pounds. A full rate of turnips for a cover crop is going to be six pounds. And so if I use, you know, two pounds of turnips, well, two out of six, that's 33%. That's 33% of a full rate. And if I go 25 pounds of soybeans, you know, that's 50% of a full rate. So now I've got 83% of a full rate as I'm building this mix. So, so that's the way we look at it. We really don't pay attention to pounds and we really aren't super concerned about seeds per square foot. Uh, we're more concerned about what percentage of a full rate of the overall mix are you putting into this. And so the calculator will help you through that. It will show you as you're adding additional things to your mix, it'll show you, you know, you're at 80% of a full rate or you're at 200% of a full rate. We think that 125% of a full rate is a good place to shoot for because when you mix these things together, it's a less competitive environment than when you grow them as a monoculture. Thus, in a less competitive environment, you can push things a little harder we can have more seeds out there to confer more benefits. And, and, and the seeding rate, as, as, the, as you set up your account within the calculator, you tell it where you live and it knows the climate history of your area. And so for people in more arid areas, those the suggested seeding rates are gonna be lower than people in higher rainfall environments, the seeding rates are gonna be higher. Just, I mean, that's the way it is. You can plant more seeds where you get more rain. So there's some automatic adjustments in what that percentage of a full rate looks like based on the geography of where you're located. So that's the way that we've approached it. We just go simply off that percentage of a full rate. And we figure that the pounds and the seeds per square foot, the seeds per acre, that will kind of take care of itself if you have that overall percentage about right. And doesn't it also address your resource concerns? If I if I'm thinking yeah. back right, so so like Tom had asked, like, like you know, if you're not, or somebody had asked, if you're not integrating livestock, you know, if you are, you're going to have a different blend, obviously, than you would if you're going from corn to soy, or if you yeah. have erosion concerns, or if it's a nutrient cycling concern. And I don't remember what every everything you have listed on there, but but it's nice that you can drill yeah. that in as well yeah absolutely you you can't you cannot go build a mix in the smart mix calculator without telling the software what you want to try to accomplish whether it be erosion prevention or supplemental grazing or breaking up compaction or nitrogen fixation <clears throat> because the system can't help you determine what the best things are going to be if it doesn't know what you want to try to accomplish so that's that's one of the first things that you have to tell the system is what are your goals for this cover crop, and then it helps you sort through the different options that are out there. Yeah, and so that goes back to the principles are the same all over, but it's context, context, context yeah. for everybody. Yep. Um, you had mentioned, you know, only half of the customers on there or the people on there might actually be buying seed from you and you don't have enough seed anyway. And now that these, um, Climate Smart Commodity Grants have come out. A lot of them deal with cover crops. We've got people enrolling in carbon programs. They're going to be implementing cover crops. And just in general, the knowledge base, and especially as fertilizer prices go up, um, people are buying more cover crop seed to, to make up for those, those nutrients. Um, is there an opportunity for more people to grow cover crop seed? Do you need that? Um, and if so, how would they go about doing that? Yeah. Hey, absolutely. Yeah, you're exactly right, Liz, that, you know, as when there's more demand, you got to have more supply. And so one of the things that we've long feared is that particularly when the government steps in and, and it infuses a bunch of money, it, it no longer allows the market to work the way that markets should work. You know, there's some artificial uh, demand put upon the market without having the supply to come along to, to meet that. So we're going to have to meet a much bigger demand in a short period of time. So we have to ramp up this supply. Uh, 
and you know, and, and the big companies aren't doing it. You know, you're not going to see you know the big seed companies developing and growing and marketing these cover crop seeds. They may be selling them, but they're not necessarily going to be doing the growing. So, and and I don't want them to. I I want this to come from more of a grassroots network, if you will, uh, appropriate term, I think. But so most of our seed that we contract, it's it's with our customer base because we know them. We know the ones who are not just the best farmers because the best farmers don't always make the best seed growers because growing seed is different than just growing grain. It, it Frankly, it requires a little bit different mindset. So we look for people that number one, want to grow seed and have the patience and have the management ability to be able to do that. Because again, you, you, you can't, you can't approach it with the same mindset because it it's a product now that I'm going to put back into the ground. So it has to be treated uh, like seed and not like grain. Uh, so, you know, we typically get most of our growers from within our customer network. And then we work with them on the agronomics. We provide the seed stock. We provide some training. You know, we'll arrange a lot of the freight and the shipping. We do a lot of the cleaning. So, you know, we take care of a lot of those things. If it's certified seed, you know, if it's anything that's a protected variety, you know, we hold the licenses, we do the certification paperwork, we do all of that. Because it's, to be honest, it's just a giant pain in the butt. And, and if you don't do it on a daily basis, it's it can be difficult. Uh, it can be overcome, but, you know, it's much easier when you're doing it on a regular basis and are familiar with the processes. So we kind of help people through that. So, you know, the biggest need that we have is for people growing cereals, you know, rye, triticale, oats, barley, that's certainly where the biggest acreages are. But we have a lot of acres of, you know, things like, you know, hairy vetch and winter peas and spring peas and cow peas and mung beans. And, you know, we're even contracting some of the specialty brassicas like our collards and turnips and uh, things like that, you know, and, and each of these kind of have a different region where they're, best suited to be grown. You can't just grow everything everywhere. So we kind of look at people in different environmental uh, areas that might fit well. So if you're interested, just shoot me an email. You know, my my email address is just Keith at greencoverseed.com. I've, I've got I've got a, uh, a great guy on staff. Scott Ravencamp is our contract production manager. He works with all of our growers. Um, I, I don't work directly with them because I just I don't have the time that it takes to, to give people the, the attention that it requires to grow seed well. So I would just get you connected with Scott and he would be able to work you through kind of what a potential contract could look like, you know, what the expectations are. One of the big things is if you don't have on-farm storage to hold this stuff, we're probably not going to be able to work with you because we can't, we can't take your harvest right out of the field. We really need to see it tested before it comes in. We have to ensure that the germination is going to be good, that there's not a bunch of noxious weed seeds in it. We need to make sure the moisture is proper. So if you don't have the facilities to, to store that after harvest, it's probably going to be pretty hard for you to, you know, kind of jump into that seed production portion of it because most companies just can't take that like an elevator does. At that seems to be a general issue not just on farm but in my mind generally with like regenerative crops so anybody out there that would like to build that infrastructure out for us that'd be cool yeah and, um, and that's a great point and and to be honest you know if you are a farmer and you're interested in doing this particularly with interest rates going up you can get some really really good loan rates the you know, the USDA uh, has some really good on-farm storage programs. So don't be afraid to go into your county office and, and talk to them about, you know, putting up some grain bins. Uh, you know, it's not cheap, but it's an investment. And if you can get that at really low interest rates and, and pay that off in five or seven years, it's a great investment for you. And, and it, it just gives you the ability to control your own destiny, whether you're growing seed for me, or growing seed for yourself and you're going to try to sell it on your own or even just growing a cash crop but you want the flexibility of being able to market and deliver on your time frame and not on the co-ops uh, invest in some infrastructure and i'd say there's some great programs and great attractive loan rates and 
I, I don't know. I, I have been, we've been working with some different entities to try to get uh, language into the new farm bill around some of this about, you know, the seed production system. You know, we're going to need more growers. We're going to need more people to haul this stuff. And we're going to need more people to clean it as well, because all the seed that's grown has to go through a cleaner somewhere. So there's going to be more need for, you know, seed, everything from seed from growing to transporting to conditioning to storing and selling you know if we're going to double and and 2.8 billion dollars being dropped into this movement could easily double the demand in three years and there's not anywhere near enough seed to do that there's plenty of people willing to grow it we just have to get organized enough to do it well and that's what's great i think even without the commodity grants but just in general, is that being able to build out this infrastructure, whether we do it from a grassroots movement or um, using grants or both, all of those things provide jobs in rural communities um, and, and it's, it's building back rural America. And I think, yeah. I know that's my goal. Um, even though I grew up in a city, that's still my goal. So um, I, I think it's really great to mention all of those, those different yeah, opportunities. It, it absolutely is. And as more people can come on and do these things, like Liz said, it just, it just bolsters your local economy. I mean, you know, our closest town here is like 200 people and I have 40 people that come to work here at our building every day. So, you know, we're drawn from all the small towns around us because obviously I don't have enough labor base right in my backyard to do it. Um, you know, we, we, we employed all the kids that we could, our own kids that we had, but we ran out of them too fast. So then we had to expand our workforce net there, but we've got a great team. And, and, you know, again, the, the things that will attract people to your business are going to be number one, what, what's your mission, particularly some of these, you know, the young, you know, the millennials, they're very passionate about what they're passionate about. And so if you don't have a really good mission and a vision for what you're trying to accomplish, you're not going to attract and, and hold a lot of people in that generation. And, and that's a great benefit for us because, you know, our mission statement is to regenerate God's creation for future generations. You know, that's a great mission. And, and a lot of people can get on board with that. And a lot of people want to be part of that movement. So that's a real attractive thing. And then you just have to develop the right culture within your business that both attracts and holds. Cause I can't compete with the co-ops on benefit packages because they're just so big and, you know, huge, but I can beat them all day long on the culture that we can provide for the work environment. That made me a little emotional. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I completely agree with that and it and you can't fake that either yeah. that that has to be real because I farmers can smell a pile of poo 800 million miles away <laughs> oh yeah oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah well we're actually at time right now so I wanted to mention your upcoming events um you have one coming up in southeast Kansas November 30th just through December 1st. Do you want to tell us what that is real quick? Yeah, so this is the third year that we're doing, we're calling it the Southeast Kansas uh, Soil Health Conference. But we have a second location in Iola, Kansas, which is kind of down in the Southeast corner. Uh, so third year that we're doing it, uh, two day event. We've, uh, Ray Archuleta is gonna be one of our headliner speakers. We've got Paul Yasa uh, from University of Nebraska. If you've never heard Paul talk, he's, in my opinion, he is the number one expert uh, at least in this country, maybe the world, I haven't heard all the world guys yet, but on, on no-till equipment, he's an engineer, but he's also got tons of practical experience in, in setting equipment, adjusting equipment for this regenerative type system. So he's going to be really good. Uh, kind of a fun thing, the Peterson Farm Brothers, if you've never heard them, they make parodies, agricultural song parodies, uh, and they're going to be talking not, not necessarily about soil health specifically, but about ag advocacy, which is really important because as, as ag and consumers interact in environmental groups, it's going to be really important that we, we have a great story to tell. We have to tell it in the right way. We have to be honest, but we also have to you know, be firm in how we tell that. 
So they're big advocates for agriculture. So we're going to have a discussion around that advocacy. And then, you know, Dale Strickler with our, within our organization will be talking. And then we've got a number of uh, local farmers who have had really good successes with uh, implementing these regenerative practices into their operation. So uh, that, that will be um, a, a great way to, to learn all about that. So, uh, and, and then I, I did see somebody asked about getting a copy of the SOA Health Resource Book. Uh, you can go to our website. We just spent a ton of time revamping our whole resource section. So you can actually go on there and you can download PDF copies of all of the old ones and there's also a place right on that resources section where you can request a copy to be sent out to you. So just go to Green Cover. Uh, you can either go to greencover.com or greencoverseed.com. Either one will get you to that. And then click on resources and there'll be a place there for all the resource guides, as well as our past webinars that we've done too. Yeah. Yep. And you're, sorry, you're I, right, may just, I may have just overloaded Noah. <laughs> yeah, no, and we will be, we'll be at the Fuller Field School any of the events that we go to, we'll have these at too. We'll be at the uh, uh, Prairie Foods uh, one as well. Yeah, oh, and look at that right there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So this is coming up November fourteenth and fifteenth in Pratt, Kansas. Um, they did it last year. It was a great, great event, and Keith is a keynote speaker there. Um, if you haven't heard, I don't know what presentation you're giving, but if you haven't heard him speak. <sighs> He, yeah, he does an it'll, excellent job. It'll be carbonomics. Okay. So the carbonomic uh, talk is excellent. I'm sure it changes up as, as the days go by, but it's it's great. And then uh, Green Cover Seed will also be with us at the Big Soul Health event in Cedar Falls, Iowa, December 5th and 6th. Um, you can use the QR code there to uh, register. We are going to have some great speakers including uh, Rick Haney, whoever that guy is, uh, Lance Gunderson, um, Russell Hedrick, Adam Chapel, Adam Darty. We have Brian Darty from Iowa State um, Extension Research. And we are actually going all the way into more depth with carbon with Dr. Jerry Hatfield and then into human health with Erin Meyer. And she is a chef and regenerative ag um, advocate out of Illinois. Uh, she's awesome. So we're, we're really looking forward to that. We also have a regenerative beer brewing contest there um, with taste testing. So if you're into that kind of thing, um, we'll have that as well. It, it's going to be a lot of fun and, and hope to see you there. And I'll go back to this one in case you want to scan the QR code to join Prairie Food and Keith. Um, but I really appreciate Appreciate you being on here and and it was great and I think we probably could have talked for another couple hours uh, well we can always do it again if you'd like so. <laughs> yes I would love that that would be great and um, I don't know if you'll be there next week but um, at Gail Fuller's at the uh, Fuller Field School in Severy Kansas that's going to be a great event yeah. as well um, I'll be there and um, Green Cover C will be there and um, I think Jess just put the website there in the chat if you're interested at fullerfieldschool.com. And I want to thank everybody for being here today and especially you, Heath. This is a great conversation. And yes, let's set another one up. I think it'd be an awesome idea. All right. Thanks, Liz. Thanks for joining okay. everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you.